Yes, thank you very much for the introduction. So today I'm going to present a joint work with Stefan Jimbowski and Sebastian Faust. And the main idea is to build a protocol which allows fair exchange of digital goods. The setup is as follows. We have two parties, a buyer and a seller. And the seller owns a file X that he wants to give to the buyer in exchange for some money. So the buyer wants to receive the correct X and he verifies its correctness using some hash that he knows. And fairness means that the buyer only needs to pay the coins if the file is indeed correct. And uh, fairness for the seller means that if he sells the file, then he's the right file, then he's guaranteed to get the money. But the big question is, who starts? Because if the seller first sells the file or gives the file, who guarantees him that he will get the money eventually? And for the buyer, we have the same problem. If he first gives the coins, who guarantees him that he will get the correct file? So it has actually been shown that it's impossible to build such a protocol without a trusted third party. And a trusted third party, so let's, let's think about how it would look like if we had a trusted third party. It's actually quite straightforward. Uh, both parties give their information to the trusted third party and it verifies locally if the file is correct and pays out the money accordingly. The problem with trusted third parties is that they're actually really hard to come by or are very expensive. In this scenario, the buyer and the seller could be parties on different, in different countries or even different continents and uh, the seller wants to sell a large movie, for example. So to find a party that both of them trust is very hard. So a question which naturally occurs here is, can we use blockchain to build this trusted third party? And that's a very uh, interesting idea because the blockchain naturally handles money already. So let me quickly recap what blockchain is again, sorry. So uh, when we have a transaction, then it's sent to a decentralized network of miners. And these miners verify if the transaction is correct. And if this is the case, they will eventually uh, included into one of the blocks of the blockchain. And this technology has some nice advantages. Um, particularly, it uh, guarantees us that whenever a transaction is included in the blockchain, it cannot be reverted. If I have a new transaction which is correct, it will eventually be included, and everything which is stored in the blockchain is public to everyone in the world. But we cannot just do simple transactions, we can also do smart contracts. And smart contracts means that we just extend the, trans the transfer of money with some conditions. So like a lottery or a chess contract where uh, the money is only paid to the winner. So the straightforward solution how to build fair exchange with a smart contract would look like this. Pretty similar to our trusted third party. It would first get the hash and the money stores the money, then receives the file. And since we just learned that all the data in the blockchain is transparent, the buyer would now be able to see the file and read it from the smart contract. And everything that's left for the smart contract to do is hash the big file and verify if it's the correct hash. If this is the case, the seller gets the payment. If this is not the case, the buyer gets his money back. There's one more trick that we have to apply here, that if the seller never sends the file, then at some point the buyer should get his money back after some time out. The problem is when the file gets large, because storing something on a decentralized blockchain is very, very expensive. So if we go back to the example where we want to sell a movie, this is not really feasible in some cryptocurrency like Ethereum. So these contracts get way too expensive. There is a line of work which proposes to solve this problem with zero knowledge. I don't want to get into too much detail how zero knowledge works, but I want to give you a high level idea. The main clue is that the seller encrypts the file and then hashes the key. And she proves in zero knowledge that he did this correctly. And then he gives the, send the buyer the encrypted file, the hash of the key and this proof, the zero knowledge proof. And the buyer can now verify that all of this was done correctly. So verifying the zero knowledge proof will guarantee him that once the pre-image to the hash is revealed, he has the correct file. So now he's convinced, you know, uh, convinced of this statement. He sends the hash of the key and the coins to the contract. The seller reveals the key. The key is then again leaked to the buyer who can decrypt the file. 
And the smart contract only has to verify if the key is the correct pre-image of the hash. And this is actually very nice because uh, this is very simple to do. This is only a single hash of a very small input. So this smart contract is very efficient in cost. The problem with this is, as we've heard today in the keynote, zero knowledge proofs get very expensive when we have, again, a large file. Uh, particularly the algorithm that the sender has to run uh, takes a lot of time, and the proof that has to be sent in the first message gets very, very large. So while this is a very nice and powerful tool, we wanted to find a system where we can improve both the cost of the contract and the efficiency of the overall protocol. So our protocol, called FairSwap, has, is built on a very simple idea. And this idea is that we prove to the smart contract later if the sender ah. misbehaved. And it consists of a proof of misbehavior, which are three algorithms. The first algorithm, encode, is run on the sender side and outputs an encoding Z, which can be sent to the buyer. The buyer can then commit his coins. The key is revealed, and once the key is out there, the buyer can extract the file from the original encoding. And he either receives the correct file at this point, or he doesn't. And at that point, he can, he can go to the smart contract, which we call a judge in this case, and complain about the whole procedure. And the last algorithm, the judge algorithm, is very efficient, runs inside the smart contract, and uh, correctly verifies if the sale happened or not. And based on, this, uh, on the uh, result of this algorithm, the money is paid out. So before I go into detail how we built these three algorithms, I want to quickly introduce the main building block of the system, which are Merkle tree uh, commitments. And the main idea is that or this Merkle tree commitments are a very, uh, very nice tool because they allow to commit to a very large file only with a single small hash. And how do we do this? We split the large file in n different, much smaller file chunks and hash every two of these file chunks together and repeat the process until we receive one small root hash. Now, the nice part is when I want to verify that one of these elements was inside the root hash or inside the Smirkle tree, then I only need a very small amount of, of information to verify or to convince someone of this statement. So the commitment is linear in the amount of file chunks, and the verification is only logarithmic. OK, so now you've seen the um, Merkle tree commitment. I can show you the three algorithms. So the first one is encode. This is run on the sender side, takes as input the file and the key, and outputs the encoding. And the first step that we do is we create a vector, which consists first of the n file chunks. And then I run this Merkle tree. And for every output of the hash, I store exactly this hash in my vector. And the next step is then to take the key and encrypt this vector into my encoding. This data structure, this vector, the encoding, is then sent to the receiver who runs, once he learned the key, the extract algorithm. It takes also as input this encoding and the key and outputs the file and the proof of misbehavior. The first step is, of course, it decrypts this uh, encoding to receive the file and the hashes. Then it runs the Merkle tree and checks the output of the Merkle tree. So if the root is correct, the exact root that he's expecting, then he has the file, everything is good, he can stop. The big problem is, what if this is not the right hash he's expecting? Then the file he got is incorrect. So then he compares his own output with the hash or the output that the seller committed to, that the seller sent in the encoding. And in this case, we see the, cla uh, the seller claims that this is actually the right hash. So somewhere in the computation of this Merkle tree has to be a, a fake value. So for every of the values in the Merkle tree, he now compares his own value and the one that the sender committed to. And there in the second step, we find there was a, the seller lied. The seller lied about the value y2. So now the buyer has to prove exactly this fact, exactly this hash to the judge contract. And in order to do this, he needs the input to the hash function and the output. And the judge doesn't really get this x values, but he gets the encoding. So the proof of misbehavior consists of these three elements of the encoding. So let's look at the last algorithm, the judge. Well, it's also the first step to decrypt these elements again to receive the inputs of the hash and the output. and then after the hash, it can compare the computed value with the one that the seller claimed it was. And if this is identical, 
then there was no misbehavior. But if this is not identical, then he found misbehavior, outputs one, which means the sender misbehaved. But there's one, one big problem to this, because at this point, the buyer could simply lie about the values of that. So we need to add a countermeasure to protect the integrity of these, of these values. And we do this by verifying or by, by proving that these three elements were in the original message, the original encoding set. And we use exactly this uh, Merkle tree commitment that I have described before to efficiently, ver to efficiently prove that these three elements uh, were part of that. Great. So now we've seen the three algorithms. Let's take a look at the final protocol. First, the seller encodes the file, sends it to the buyer. And the buyer now has to generate the root hash of the file and commit this root hash to the smart contract together with the hash of the file. The root hash automatically is, or the seller can see the root hash in the smart contract and has to verify if this is actually right. If this is not the right root hash, he stops the protocol at this point. If this is correct, then he continues by revealing the key. The key is sent to the buyer, and the buyer can now decrypt, uh, decode his file. And then he can run the complaint algorithm uh, to the judge, uh, to the judge smart contract, who can now has now all the information to verify um, that the if the sender misbehaved or not. So the security of this protocol is mainly captured in three factors. The first one is if the protocol terminates. This is very important for the buyer because his money is blocked inside that smart contract. If this never terminates, well, his money is lost forever. And we can see that the protocol terminates in five rounds. For the seller, it's very important to see if he gets his money when he behaves correctly. And this is ensured by the fact that the buyer cannot forge any proof which will be accepted by the judge. And for the buyer, it's the other way around. He has to have the guarantee that he can always generate a proof of misbehavior if he got the, uh, the wrong file. In our paper, we formally prove security of this protocol in the before mentioned UC model, but I don't want to go into details how we did it. Instead, let's look at the efficiency of the protocol. This is the two goals that we had in the beginning. The smart contract should be cheap and the efficiency of the overall protocol should be uh, good. So. When we implemented this uh, protocol as an Ethereum smart contract and evaluated its efficiency, and we uh, found out that the cost on the overhead mainly depends on the choice of these file chunks, so how large these file chunks are. It doesn't really depend so much on how large the overall file is. And we have to distinguish two cases. In the optimistic case, no complaint actually happens, and then the smart contract doesn't have to do much. And in the pessimistic case, we have to run this judge algorithm. So when we look at the cost, in the optimistic case, the cost always stays uh, roughly the same, and this is the amount of money that is needed to deploy the contract. And in the pessimistic case, the cost of running the contract rises dramatically when we have large file chunks. So we have, when we have file chunks around uh, one kilobyte, then this gets quite expensive. On the other hand, the overhead of the, the message sent between the sender and the receiver, which is an indicator we use to measure the efficiency of the protocol, uh, grows when we have too small file chunks. And the maximum size this can get is twice as large as the original file. But I didn't really show you the main contribution of the paper. I showed you one application of it. In fact, we didn't show that you can send files no, uh, knowing some hash, but we showed that you can sell witnesses knowing some circuit, some predicate pi. And the idea is that you have a circuit which consists of n gates, and for each of these, or for, you prove to the judge contract that one of these gates was computed uh, in a wrong way. We also looked into some extensions of this simple protocol. The first one is to add penalty deposits to the um, to the smart contract, particularly to to penalize the sender in case he misbehaves, because. If he sends the wrong file or doesn't even know the correct file, the, the buyer has to store money in the smart contract for quite a while, which makes it 
not it's not so nice for the buyer to just lose this money for for a while. So adding penalties ensures him that at least if he doesn't get the file at the end, he gets some small payment from the from the seller instead. Another extension is to run this protocol inside of state channels. And this is very nice when you have repeated file sets. So not just one, but actually selling many files in a row or splitting large files into smaller files and selling them one after, one after the another. So how this works is that the seller and buyer set up a channel contract on the blockchain. The buyer submits a lot of money into it, more than just for one file sale, but actually uh, enough money for repeated file sales. And then they can run the whole process offline. And this is nice because we have just seen in Christina's talk that we save a lot of costs here for deploying contracts or um, running them. And as long as they stay in the optimistic case, the overall procedure is much cheaper than running one single uh, exchange directly over the blockchain. And when we close the contract, then the whole money can be sent to the seller. In fact, this scenario also allows the seller and the buyer to switch places. So the uh, buyer can sell something to the seller and the other way around. We ex can extend this scenario even further by using existing state channels in this setting and, um, and uh, extending them to a whole network. So this is a very nice uh, applic or this is a very nice infrastructure when we have um, distributed file sets. So the, the talk from Christina earlier showed us that we can even use virtual channel to sell files over, not over direct links, but over virtual links, like in this case. And in distributed file, sale, uh, file sharing, this file can then be sent further throughout the network without adding additional cost. And this is a very nice scenario because this naturally solves the free riders problem that we have in distributed file sharing. Free riders or a free rider is a person that doesn't really participate in the in the network as it's supposed to be, but only wants to download but not share elements. And this can be quite hurtful for distributed file sharing uh, file sharing networks. So a countermeasure which has been proposed is adding small monetary uh, or paying for files in distributed file sale. So you, small, you pay a small fee when you download and you get a little bit of money when you share a file. The problem with this is now you can share wrong files, get money, and who verifies this? And it's quite easy to see how our, pro our protocol can nicely be used to outsource this verification to the, to the judge contract in the worst case, as soon as something uh, doesn't work, and use the penalties to, to penalize someone who's trying to cheat. When we combine these state channel networks and the file sale protocol, we can even incentivize that the files shared in such a network are distributed very uh, equally. Because I once in the beginning block some money in a uh, state channel, and then I start downloading, sharing. So I pay for downloading, I get money for sharing. And if I only pay in one direction, or I only get money in one direction, at some point my state channel will run out of money in one direction. So this system incentivizes that in both directions, the sharing and the downloading uh, equals out, or that we find a nice route throughout the network to rebalance these channels. OK, so with this, I conclude my talk. And we have seen today that the fair swap protocol is a novel protocol for fair exchange, which allows us to sell large witnesses and verify them very efficiently. One, on one hand, have them in very efficient smart contracts and also uh, in efficient protocols. And uh, it can be, it's provably secure in the random Oracle model. And we've also seen how we have one particular application of this for a digital file sale, which is optimized because it's, uh, we, can, we can actually come uh, make the judge contract in this case even more efficient than in the generalized scenario. And we can use it in state channels for repeated file sale and in state channel networks for distributed file sharing. So thank you very much for your attention. Yes. So I was I was wondering um, when the seller send the, f uh, the file to the buyer, um, 
um, uh, he should use uh, a private uh, communication channel, right? Or it's not it's not part of the of, of the assumptions. Otherwise, someone else can recover the file because everything is public in the blockchain. So a seller won't have any incentive to sell the file because one it's sold it's it's sold once it's gone forever. Everyone can see the the file. Yes. So that's very important to understand in this scenario that the key is not secret at the end of the protocol, which is a little counterintuitive to encryption, how we normally use it. Um, it's more of a commitment than, a, than an encryption of a file. So when he wants to keep it secret, he should use a, a secure or a secure channel to the, to the buyer. Nevertheless, at the end of the protocol, the buyer has the file. So he also needs to trust the buyer not to reveal it or share it even further. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I wondering that uh, uh, it, before before the server and encoding the before the seller encoding the field, uh, how can the seller uh, prove that the, <coughs> this field is is re actually uh, what the what the buyer what the buyer want? Uh, for example, if uh, if the buyer want to buy a film A uh, and uh, the seller uh, don't ha doesn't have doesn't have the film A, uh, and he encoded encoded film B, and uh, send send the send the information to the buyer. Uh, how how to how to ensure that? Okay, so uh, how to verify that it's the correct file? We had yeah, this hash. Yeah, yeah. So I know the hash of the film A that I want to receive. Um, this hash could be from some some database or even stored in a smart contract. And uh, knowing this hash with uh, these three algorithms, this proof of misbehavior allows me to later show that I did not get the correct file. This is only shown after the protocol or after the exchange of the, of the ciphertext. In the beginning, the seller can send the wrong file and the buyer will not see it for a while. But once the key is leaked, he can decrypt it and see that it's the wrong, the wrong movie, movie B. And then he compares it to the hash. And if this is wrong, he can prove this to the judge. And the judge will be ensured, or the, the judge can, can see exactly if it was the correct file or not. And then send the money either back to the buyer or to the seller. OK, thank you. Okay. Um, briefly, it was related to that question. Um, can you, because it's not just asking Stefan, but can you maybe say a word on how you verify arbitrary condition so that a file satisfies a certain set of properties, not just that it's the hash. Right, so that was the extension to, to circuits. And um, this is actually nice because it extends the, the applications for this, for this protocol a lot. It could be, for example, the witness could be a, a program and the circuit could be a set of test cases that I want to, to verify the program. You verify the path on the... I verify a single circuit uh, regarding its, a single gate in the circuit regarding its input and its output. And um, this requires me to also commit to the circuit. So I need to not just prove the inputs and outputs to the judge, but also which gate I'm referring to, what was the instruction, uh, which gates come in and out. So it's a little bit more uh, overhead than just the hash. That's why the distributed, that's why the file sale is efficient, more efficient than this, slightly. So, yes. So I had the same problem, uh, same question. And so you use the example of the two films, A and B, and you're assuming there is a highest value for both A and B. And then you can verify whether the file received by the buyer is the exact same one he's asking for. But in, in the real case, you know, so have a lot of files, F1, F2. You never have like any server that maintaining the highest value, so F1, F2. So in that situation, can your protocol solve the problem or not? Or, or not? So we we did not uh, give a solution how to securely distribute these hashes. Uh, so we more um, this could be, for example, in distributed file sharing. This is actually a common system that you have already a list of hashes uh, of the files in the system, or you could think of. Uh, a lot of uh, websites also provide hashes of the of the programs you can download. So this is the system we had in mind, where the where the hashes are coming from. But in a lot of situations, you never have the kind of hash values for all the files. 
I'm asking for something, and then you send me something else, and well, I pass everything. Well, you just need the, the hash of the file you expect. Yeah. You you just need to know which one you want. I mean, you need to have some sort of verification yeah. test for right. whatever I mean, you buy, and it, that could be arbitrary. Like you could think of BitTorrent, for example. Great presentation, but uh, I wonder what you want the buyer line in the complaint procedure. Uh, you see the seller uh, want to get his money. Uh, so if the the buyer lied in the committing this proof of misbehavior, yeah. then uh, the judge will find this out. So it's it's impossible to lie without finding hash collision. The judge pro procedure is conducted by the contract? Yes. Oh, and the, the smart contract will then when it finds that the proof of misbehavior is incorrect, send the money to the to the buyer uh, to the seller. So, yeah. but the but it is the buyer uh, uh, to complain. Yes. So in this case, uh, yeah. the buyer complains in the. It is not automated, uh, conducted by the smart contract, isn't it? No, the smart contract has to be to be triggered to, to verify if it's correct or not. If the buyer doesn't complain, the money automatically goes to the seller after some time out. So what if the buyer lied? Pardon? Uh, if, if the buyer needs to complain, yeah. and if this is not happening, the money goes automatically to, to the seller. Oh. Because the seller, so if the buyer cannot complain, then the file was right. So the seller should be paid, right? right. So it's a default, the default is that the, the, the seller is going to be paid yes. unless there is a complaint. Yes. Okay. As opposed to my paper last year. Yes. It's a payment that gets yes. triggered. By the way, um, there's two protocols in that paper, and one doesn't use zero knowledge. One uses a Boolean circuit, a Yao over a Boolean circuit. So, and the, the idea is not that. Well, excuse me. I I think he meant um, if the if the seller gives the buyer the correct one, but the buyer still lied during the process of complaint, what will happen? So if the buyer lied, the complaint is not successful, which means the seller still gets the money. So you mean the the judge can still uh, justify who is correct or not? If there is a complaint, the judge will, will verify this complaint and it's either successful or not. So the judge will also like have the access to the correct file, you mean that? Uh, no, to only two small elements of the... Of K the and the... Uh,